Justin Carlson, and I'm a First Aid Task Force member and very happy to be uh, joined today by two other task force members, Eunice Singletary, or Nisi, uh, who's the chair of the First Aid Task Force and professor at the Department of Emergency Medicine, the University of Virginia in the United States, and David Zeidman, who comes to us from London, England, is the vice chair of the First Aid Task Force, retired anesthesiologist or anesthetist, depending on what part of the world you're from, and member of the International Olympic Committee. Nisi, David, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you, Justin. So I wanted to start a little bit uh, talking about the, the task force here. So what are some big things that we'll be talking about today as kind of a primer to get folks uh, a better understanding of what we'll cover. And then we can go into each of those details uh, as we go along. So over the last um, uh, five years, basically, since the last review, um, we've, uh, the task force has done a lot of reviews, both systematic reviews and scoping reviews and evidence updates, looking at uh, previous topics and also looking for new topics. So during this session, because there is a limited amount of time, um, I'm going to talk mainly about trauma first aid and uh, Nisi is going to talk about medical first aid. And I think as we go through it, you'll begin to get the feel of uh, what we've actually done. We're not going to cover all the topics. We're going to cover the interesting ones, ones with special interests. Great. And so a, a couple other big ones related to trauma, tourniquets or tourniquets. What other ones are, are we going to focus on here today? So... On, this is the list of uh, trauma first aid topics. Um, and what I've tried to do is highlight the ones in yellow that I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about today. Um, so as you can see at the top here, um, as you said, tunicase, control of severe life-threatening external bleeding. Uh, I'll also try and cover a little bit on pediatric tunicates, manual cervical spine stabilization, first aid dressings for superficial thermal burns, and compression wrap for closed extremity joint injuries. So if that's the list you're happy with, I'm quite happy to try and go into um, control of severe life-threatening external bleeding and cover those four topics within it. Absolutely, that sounds like a, a great plan of things we can cover in the next little bit here. Um, and as you mentioned, there, there's a lot more in the first aid documents that doesn't allow for the short time period that we have here. Uh, but I think those are some really high level, uh, very impactful PICOs, very impactful questions that we can explore during this time. Okay, so, so thank you, Justin. There's quite a lot of detail and information here. And I'm gonna try and give you a kind of what I call a bird's eye or a window view. Um, it's the kind of fly past view of what was actually uh, put into the new documents, basically the new co-stars. So let's um, start with uh, pressure dressings, uh, bandages, devices, uh, manual pressure, for example. And I think the task force um, did, well, the task force did a systematic review on this um, and reviewed it again. It was the whole of this topic of, of bleeding was actually taken uh, over as a, as a, a mega pico, um, a, a big pico encompassing all the topics. And this was one of the topics basically. So, not surprisingly, uh, we found recommendation for using direct manual compression compared with uh, other compression devices. Um, so actually using your hands to press rather than relying on any mechanical device is better than um, is, is the better way of stopping uh, external bleeding. Um, and we also found that we had to recommend against use of pressure points. We found they didn't work. And for those who know the 2015 guidelines, this isn't much of a change, basically. If we then move on um, and go to um, hemostatic dressings, which I think is the next follow on. So if you're going to press on the wound, basically press on the bleeding point, probably it is better uh, that you press on it with a hemostatic dressing or try and pack the dressing into that bleeding point. Um, and Hemostatic dressing together with direct pressure seems the first two points uh, that most people would try and manage severe life-threatening external bleeding. However, moving on again, we did do a lot of work on tourniquets um, or tourniquets, as, um, uh, depending on which work part of the world you come from. Um, and we found that if the uh, wound is subject to being able to be controlled by a tourniquet, 
that to using a tourniquet properly and applied properly uh, is probably better than uh, direct manual pressure alone uh, for severe life-threatening external bleeding. Uh, we also found that it was the same for he with hemostatic dressings, but if it uh, wasn't available, then again, we must go back to direct manual pressure and probably with or without a hemostatic dressing. I think you mentioned something uh, really key in there about kind of the training piece of tourniquets is that people need to have some experience with them, need to have some comfort level or some understanding of how to use them to use them appropriately. Um, and that that's a key part of, of using them in, in the process of controlling hemorrhage. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, Justin. Um, if you don't use these properly, they're actually more dangerous than not using them at all. Uh, if you don't apply them tightly enough, or you are tempted to release them to see if the bleeding's been controlled, you will end up with catastrophic hemorrhage, or you can use, end up with catastrophic hemorrhage, which is, uh, and then you won't get, to, and you may not be able to control it. Um, so using, being trained to use one of these tourniquets, and it's the next point, probably using a manufactured tourniquet, um, one of the windlass, the ones where you can tighten the, um, uh, the tightness of the, um, of the tourniquet by twisting a bar, basically. Uh, and it has to be twisted quite tightly, and it's quite painful when you apply the tourniquet. Uh, it's better than trying to use an improvised tourniquet, such as a, a, a bow tie or an ordinary tie, basically. Um, you probably aren't going to get a tight enough occlusion to stop the bleeding. Um, I think also uh, people need to understand about tourniquets. They are very good at stopping bleeding when they're applied properly. They, there are a number of um, consequences of using them. Um, so I'm not going to go into those now, but I think people need to be aware, uh, and this should come into the training of when you apply a tourniquet, uh, how you should do it, how long you should keep it on for, which is until you've got control of the bleeding, and that you should never remove it unless you've got uh, some way of, of controlling that uh, catastrophic bleeding. Uh, so in other words, it needs to be in hospital under controlled conditions. Great. No, that's, that's very useful from a, a first aid standpoint to recognize almost a hierarchy of, of different approaches to hemostatic, con to the control of bleeding when someone's having significant life-threatening bleeding with manual direct pressure still being such a key part of that, of that process. Yeah, so one of the uh, other points, so the other uh, systematic review we did, we looked at hemostatic devices. There are a number of these on the market and are, being, are going through various research stages at the present time. The problem is there is no uh, um, comparative evidence to recommend us, uh, to, uh, for us to recommend to you the use of junctional tourniquets and similarly the use of wound clamps. Uh, there is no real evidence uh, ar around using these, so they have not been recommended in the current set uh, of co-stars. And I think that brings us, that was the whole story of control of life-threatening bleeding. Great, well, well thank you for that. I appreciate summarizing, because I know that was a, a very large body of work looking at each of those different kind of sub questions in this massive PICO uh, that, that encompass control of life-threatening bleeding. So thank you for summarizing and synthesizing that for us to kind of help take a few or get a few good take-home points from it. One other point I wanted to make about this uh, very complex review of control of life-threatening bleeding is that we did not look at the order or sequence of care for life-threatening bleeding. And Part of that is because there's just really no studies out there that look at that. And um, secondly, it's going to vary depending upon where the bleeding occurs, if it's something that's compressible or not, if it's amenable to a tourniquet, as David said, or not. Um, and this is where the various organizations that um, teach first aid and develop first aid curriculum will have to look at it for creating their guidelines. It's also gonna vary obviously depending upon if you're in the United States or if you're in Australia, New Zealand or in Europe, uh, where you are and what your resources are. Um, and and if, uh, also the ability to train, as you mentioned, is extremely important because um, while you can have what's called just-in-time instructions for applying a tourniquet, um, it's been shown that actual training rather than just the in time tourniquets by themselves, that those instructions by themselves um, will 
enable a person to better be able to retain the information and the skill for applying a tourniquet. Well, let's, let's move on, David. You had another couple trauma talks, trauma picos you wanted to, to discuss. And then Nisi, we'll turn it over to you to explore some of the, the medical picos, the medical questions that were explored by the First Aid Task Force. Yeah, so let's just carry on with the controlling of bleeding for a bit. Uh, so one of the scoping reviews that kind of came out of the control of bleeding uh, was about pediatric tourniquets. Um, uh, and we tried to look at tourniquets being used in children under the age of 19 um, and compare them uh, with uh, whether they work as an, a commercial elastic rat tourniquet or a commercial rat ratcheting tourniquet, which we've talked about already, compared with um, a windlass type tourniquet. Uh, do they have, um, are, are they effective? And it's quite surprising, actually, that we found very, very little evidence um, for the use of tunica in children. Um, it's not that it's not there, it's just not brought out in separate studies, in comparative studies. Uh, and the tunica, and sorry, the task force felt that it was very important um, that people recognize the importance of early con the early control of severe life-threatening bleeding in children, certainly under the age of two, because of their small blood volume. So basically, you want to keep the blood in the circulation rather than let it uh, 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 dribble out or spurt out basically all over the floor. It's better that it's in rather than out, basically. Um, in addition to that, um, in the absence of evidence, um, the, uh, the task force did feel that in this age group, in this young age group, um, that we could, we would still wish to recommend um, what we would, uh, what we had uh, in the adult section, basically, which is that if it was amenable to use uh, to the use of a tourniquet, uh, that we should go ahead and use a tourniquet. Uh, but if it wasn't, then using direct pressure uh, was probably the answer, with or without a hemostatic uh, dr uh, dressing. Um, it was agreed and that uh, there is a need for design and use of tourniquets in small children. Uh, the big tourniquet, the tourniquets we have aren't particularly effective in, in the very small, very small limbed children basically, uh, but that's yet to come and I think uh, we are about to publish this scoping review and hopefully we will come up with a systematic review uh, or a more detailed systematic review of the use of tourniquets in children in the very near future. Well, thank you for the work that, that you and others have done in that space, because trauma certainly is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality throughout the world. Um, and a significant portion of that is due to large volume hemorrhage. So whatever we can do, especially at the first aid level, because with those large, uh, with significant hemorrhage, that can happen very quickly, can sometimes happen before other medical personnel can get on the scene. So thank you for the work that you and the others on the task force who did to kind of raise, uh, first of all, raise the PICO question and then help to answer it with the, some of the best available evidence that's out there. So thank you. Um, so, you, you keep, so you keep saying thank you to me and thank you to Nisi. You're a member of the task force and you know there are 17 on the task force and they work really hard to get these uh, questions up and running. Uh, it's, it is very difficult, and EC will say the same, I'm sure, trying to produce um, evidence-based guidelines and evidence-based statements on the very limited amount of science evidence supporting first aid. And we'd encourage everybody listening to this to um, please go away and go and do your studies, go and do the research, because we need more evidence to be able to produce something which is meaningful uh, for the future. But I want to explore two more areas, uh, or, or just a couple other areas, um, and that's cervical stabilization, um, some, some questions around burns, and then uh, extremities, uh, joint injuries, because we did have a systematic review around that. Uh, just kind of sticking with the uh, uh, trauma theme, tell me a little bit about what was, what was found with manual cervical stabilization. Yeah, so this was a very interesting one. Um, when we did the 2015 um, co-stars and guidelines and statements, basically, we found that <clears throat> there was very little evidence to support, for example, the use of collars um, uh, in um, uh, cervical collars, basically. And out of that came a number of questions. Is, well, what should we do with somebody who actually does need their head supported? Um, that, you know, they, they can't, they basically, there may be an injury, et cetera, 
And there was a lot of talk in the task force about should we actually manually stabilize this, just hold the head, or should we use uh, such techniques as a trap squeeze, basically, or a head squeeze maneuver using your, using your knees, your legs, basically, if you're kneeling down beside the patient to actually uh, control um, the, the patient's head position. Um, and there is no doubt out there in, in the uh, pre-hospital world that some people do uh, find it really difficult um, not to um, hold somebody's head um, who's actually been in, a, in a quite a bad accident, uh, but doesn't necessarily have any signs that would actually indicate the use of a collar, even if you did want to use one. Um, interestingly, in the scoping review, again, no studies were found to evaluate these manual stab stabilization techniques, such as um, trap squeeze or head squeeze. Um, but again, the task force felt that we couldn't just leave it there. Um, and what we felt was, again, it comes down to training, education, practice, that people need to be taught to hold heads properly, um, to support people's heads properly. It may be that it's more comfortable for the injured party, the patient, uh, to hold the head themselves uh, when they move around, if they find it that painful. Um, uh, on the other hand, it may be something that, for example, if you've got a patient who has been, uh, who's unconscious, that they may need their head held in a stable position um, while you move them onto a scoop stretcher, for example, um, so that it doesn't flop around and therefore cause an injury uh, because they're unconscious. Um, and I think it's important that we teach people how to use the head squeeze techniques, how to use manual stabilization, how to use your hands basically to hold somebody's head and to keep it in a stable position. It doesn't sound much, but it's probably very, very important considering that we do still, recommend, do, do still say that there is very little evidence for the use of collars and uh, cervical collars in these types of patients. I'm sure you've got comments on that, both of you being uh, uh, emergency physicians. I see Nisi with her hand up. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so the first thing I wanted to say is that this was a scoping review, not a systematic review on manual cervical stabilization. So a scoping review is basically looking at what's the literature out there? What evidence do we have for using the hands or, or knees to manually stabilize somebody with a, a suspected neck injury, spine injury, um, and there was almost no literature out there. But with the scoping review, we're just documenting what literature there is. We're not coming up with a recommendation, um, although there are other organizations that write guidelines, they may end up coming out with a recommendation to use manual stabilization when there's a, a high index of suspicion or high risk for a cervical injury. Um, but this is not an ill core recommendation to use manual stabilization. The scoping reviews is basically um, making a map of the evidence that is out there and we just did not find enough evidence uh, to say we need to do a systematic review and come out with a um, official treatment recommendation. That could happen in the future though. It, it is challenging sometimes to come up with a firm recommendation when there's limited evidence but again I appreciate that the, the effort is put in to try to at least put some recommendation down because at the end of the day, anybody who's in that situation as a first aid provider mm -hmm. still needs to address that question, whether we have great evidence or not. And so that's where the scoping review at least kind of helps to put that together. And then Nisi, as you mentioned, the individual councils can put together whatever uh, guidelines they feel are, are most beneficial for their patient population um, and their, their, their uh, providers who are in that area based on education, based on other resources that are available there. So um, I appreciate that coming through with, uh, with this, uh, given the fact that it was a scoping review. Speaking of scoping reviews, I want to switch gears just a little bit David, to one other, one other PICO that the First Aid Task Force looked at, and that was the dressing for superficial burns, certainly a, an area where there's a lot of historical things that have been done, but wanted to see what the task force came up with and what, what insight uh, you gleaned from the information that's out there about what we should do for treating superficial burns in the first aid setting. Uh, thank you, Justin. So, uh, and thank you, Nisi. It's a very important comment. So again, this is a scoping review. Uh, there is no particular recommendation that comes out at the end of it, and it's basically to look at uh, what's, on, what's currently published and what's on the horizon. 
And we were very, very surprised and very concerned that for superficial burns, which is probably the most common type of burn seen in, in, um, in the general public and out, outside uh, hospitals, basically, um, the, the scold burn, the steam burn, etc. Basically, there was very little um, information as to how to treat this properly. And, and certainly <clears throat> virtually no information uh, uh, to identify what type of dressing um, people in a first aid setting should put on these type of burns. Um, most of the evidence, actually all of the evidence, was um, about ongoing care uh, for partial or full thickness burns um, in, within the hospital, basically. Um, so again, this is, um, there's a huge gap here. Um, there's a, a, a need uh, for people to understand how to manage these burns. And from that point of view, the task force did agree that the immediate and effective cooling of burns is still the primary intervention with the, uh, the most proven efficacy. And in fact, along these lines, having said that, uh, I can say in advance that we are about to start a full systematic review on cooling of burns. It was done in 2015, it's gonna be done again, um, and uh, we're gonna be looking at the evidence ag again within those, um, within those parameters. So not much on the way of evidence for actual dressings. Um, what if you asked me, um, and if this was uh, a discussion group, basically, I would actually say, why didn't you just put some cling film over the top of it? But that didn't come out in the in the science, basically, which is disappointing because um, it, something should be there to actually say what type of dressing a first aider should use for a superficial burn. And David, I think back to what you had mentioned before, that just continually highlights the limited strong evidence in the first aid setting for a number of these questions, right? That there are limited, uh, limited trials to begin with and extremely limited high quality large trials that would help us really answer that question. So as task force members kind of go through and try to synthesize the information as best as best can be done, but many times there's, there's not great evidence one way or another and, and uh, individual councils then are left making that decision with the best available evidence that the task force is able to put together and pool for them. So interesting. Any other, uh, any other questions or comments that, that you had, David, for those before we switch to Nisi um, for some of, the other, uh, some of the other PICOs here? So <clears throat> if I just, uh, there are a couple more, basically. Just, just a couple very quickly. Compression wrap for joint injury is a systematic review that was done and has been published. Um, and what it was looking for is, should you apply compression wrap or elastic wrap bandage uh, rather than no compression wrap or elastic wrap to a peripheral injury, basically. Um, looking at that, just that very, very specific question, should you apply one or not apply one without any other uh, consideration of elevation or ice or anything else, there was no evidence for or against the use of a compression wrap. In other words, we couldn't make a recommendation that you should use one or you shouldn't use one. But this was limited by the fact that uh, it didn't include the typical rice or ice uh, uh, mnemonic, basically, uh, which was rest uh, and compression and ice and elevation, etc. So it is a limited finding, uh, but I think it's important to realize that a bandage on its own, a dressing on it, a bandage on its own, there is an evidence for or against it. Um, plus the fact um, that much of the evidence we did do, we did receive basically was again from an in-hospital setting and therefore it becomes downgraded using our grade processing system. Um, and uh, that basically takes a lot of the uh, evidence information out of the recommendation. So again, uh, a difficult one, very, very little in the way of evidence, um, very, very confined, very restricted study, uh, which may be confounded in its own way, basically, but an important um, statement to make. There is one other, which is one of my particular uh, interests, basically, and that's a single stage, a si simple single stage concussion scoring system, uh, I would just say that we didn't find one. There are s scoring systems for use uh, for athletes and sport, basically, um, but these are double <coughs> two-stage scoring systems and they are restricted to be used by uh, medical personnel. 
We didn't find anything for the general public, for first aiders. And it's really important because people need to make these decisions very, very quickly. Should you let the person who's just fallen off his bicycle get back on and cycle home, having banged his head? Is he concussed? And I, I think that there's a huge gap here. Um, uh, we've been trying to talk to people about how it, the, it's necessary to have something uh, that first aiders can use in a simple way. And it's not about Glasgow Coma scoring these people. If they have an abnormal Glasgow Coma score, they shouldn't get back on their bicycle and they should go to hospital to see why they've got an abnormal Glasgow Coma score. So I'll finish on that point. I'm not going to say anything more. I've made my little statement. Um, and it just shows you how much work we need to do, basically, uh, to get um, these first aid uh, trauma guidelines and trauma statements uh, into uh, a, a evidence-based practice. Absolutely. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate that. And yeah, it certainly comes through in the multiple trauma-related PICOs addressed by the First Aid Task Force and just how, how little information there is in that area really providing us with strong, strong data to make convincing uh, or, or confirmatory statements on it. I want to switch gears a little bit and, and uh, Nisi switch over to you on the medical side. And, and I guess just from kind of a high level view as, as the chair of the entire task force, just broadly, what, what topic that the first aid task force reviewed did you find most surprising uh, from an answer standpoint and, and, and maybe why? Why was that? Why was that so interesting? Yeah. Uh, yes, Justin. I think um, that's a great question, and the answer is heat stroke cooling, and it's really a hot topic, pun intended, because we all know that it seems to be getting hotter and hotter every summer. We've got daily, worldwide reports of new record high temperatures um, every summer, and before COVID, we were getting ready to have the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo this uh, last August, I believe it was. And we, just a year ago in Tokyo, had a terrible heat wave. Uh, there were uh, close to 60 people died from heat stroke and another 18,000 were taken to hospitals in just a week. So this was a very important systematic review that the task force um, did. And we had several surprising findings um, as a result of this review. Um, the group that reviewed it looked at 12 different active cooling techniques where you are actively doing something to cool somebody compared with passive cooling where you're basically taking the person out of the heat. Um, they found 27 different controlled studies and two co cohort studies. And the main outcome that they found was the rate of body temperature reduction, which is very important, Justin, because as you know, um, as an emergency physician, the faster you cool somebody, uh, the better the chances are that they will survive and survive without brain or other organ damage. So um, the review found that water immersion techniques with temperatures between 1 to 17 degrees centigrade and for our North American people 33.8 to 63 degrees about were more effective for lowering core temperature compared with passive cooling in adults who had hyperthermia. And this was, they were mostly individuals who had exercise induced hyperthermia. Um, I think there was just one or two studies that actually had exercise induced heat stroke, exertional heat stroke. So there is some indirectness and some extrapolation of findings for heat stroke with this review. Um, the thing that was really surprising though, Justin, is that there, that water immersion cooled fastest than anything else, including commercial ice packs to the groin or the axilla, showers, using ice sheets or towels, misting and fanning, all the evaporative methods. And I'm going to ask while I'm talking for David, yeah, to have the, the graph up. Um, but what you can see on the graph is that temperate water immersion, which is between 20 and 26 degrees centigrade, cooled almost as fast as ice water immersion. Um, and we've got some reasons that we theorize for why this may happen. But the point is, is that you don't really need ice, ice water to cool somebody. If you have temperate water, that is good. That will help lower body temperature almost as fast as ice cooling. Um, and the other thing that was surprising is that many forms of active cooling were no better or they were marginally better than passive cooling. 
And this is, was especially surprising for evaporative cooling. I mean, I myself have, was taught for years and years that evaporative cooling was highly effective, misting and fanning. Well, this review had um, two controlled studies, granted only 23 subjects that were cooled by evaporative means for exertional hyperthermia with only marginally faster cooler rates compared with passive cooling. Um, and then the other thing that they found is that commercial ice packs, so the instant cold packs you can keep in a first aid kit, applied to the groin or the neck or the axilla. In two studies, they found no difference in cooling with that compared to just taking somebody out of the heat and passive cooling. Um, but there was a trend towards it being better. And in one study, they found that, that suggested that there's faster cooling when you put those ice packs on the face, the hands, and the feet. So the bottom line here is that those ice packs, if you don't have water, what do you do? Those ice packs to the face, hands, feet, and maybe even the neck, groin, and axilla may be of some benefit. Um, the other thing that was surprising is that things like ice sheets and ice towels that many people um, have recommended over the years for cooling heat stroke um, and reflective blankets and other devices like cooling vest and hand cooling devices really did not cool the body any faster than just plain passive cooling. So um, that I thought was the biggest surprise out of that study. Um, although I have to say that there weren't very many studies, Justin, that com evaluated combinations of cooling therapies, such as using ice packs and misting and fanning. Um, and then the final surprising thing is there are no reports of mortality in comparative studies or organ dysfunction or adverse effects related to cooling. You would think that would be something studied, but it's what we have is what we've got. And that's what's the rate of cooling. What's the fastest ways of cooling somebody? So what we're seeing here on this graph are all the different techniques. Kind of you can see the, the rate of cooling as you go from left to right is lower with ones on the right evaporative cooling being really minimal. Um, and then the various temperatures of water kind of on the left-hand side. And yeah, very similar um, rates of cooling almost regardless of the temperature, whether it's zero to five degrees Celsius, they see 14 to 17, 20 to 26, all relatively similar there. That's really for interesting. Water. Yes, for water immersion. Yes, absolutely. So with that, what was the recommended way to cool a person? If you, you know, if you, if you have water, we've got that. What if you don't have water immediately available or don't have ice immediately available? Yeah, so again, um, I would first think about potential water sources that you may not have considered. You know, is there a garden hose nearby that you can hose a person down with? Is there a shower indoors that a person can be put into a cold shower? Um, do you have a cooler that has some melted ice in it? Um, do you have a stream nearby or a pond where you can get water and douse a person with it? Um, and then there's also the question about, well, how do you immerse them um, without drowning them especially? And I think that um, the studies have shown that if you have an inflatable kiddie pool that you take with you uh, to say a scene, a, um, a sports event or whatever, where there's a first aid tent, that that's something to consider having in advance. Um, the other thing is, is having a tarp that you can put a person in along with uh, ice from a cooler or ice in a little water. That's called the, the taco method or tarp assisted cooling oscillation. And if you look that up on uh, YouTube, there's a great video. Just um, type in a search for TACO, all in capital letters, method of cooling, and it'll show you a way to do it. Um, but if there's absolutely no water whatsoever, passive cooling does work. It's just slower. And it should be combined with calling for advanced medical care, emergency care at the same time. Because again, the faster you get somebody cooled, out of the sun to a cooler environment, out of the heat to a cooler environment, removing excess clothing and so forth, the faster they're going to cool. And I would absolutely, despite this evidence, continue trying to do anything else you can, including if there's any way to mist a person and fan the person. If you have those little ice packs, commercial ice packs, pack those into the groin and axilla while you're fanning and moving them out of the heat. Do a combination of techniques while you're waiting for that ambulance to arrive. David, you had something you wanted to add there. Yeah, so just, just on a couple of technical points. So let me just say that this study was um, aimed at, uh, very strongly aimed at uh, what was gonna happen in Tokyo in the Olympics. Um, and they've taken that on board. 
Um, we had actually designed, there is a system designed for Tokyo, which involves um, ice water immersion for athletes who collapse on the course. Um, but one of the important things um, is that the temperature, and this is not normally uh, available uh, for first aiders, but the temperature has to be a core temperature measurement. If you can't measure core temperatures, um, there are um, recommendations, for example, if you're going to do temperate or ice water immersion, um, that you probably 15 minutes in, in that type of environment uh, with total body immersion uh, will be enough. Um, in, but it has to be total body immersion. It can't just be part of the body. Um, that is not effective. It means the hot areas remain hot and the cold areas get cold, but nothing happens in between. But it's a, it's a technical issue. Um, you can overcall these people. But as Nisi said, the important thing is that you remove them from the heat source. You start to call them immediately. Uh, you call for advanced medical help. And these people need to actually go to hospital, have a core temperature measurement, and the, temp and the cooling be continued. And we've considered uh, we would, you know, you, this is the one time where you need a, a, a nice air-conditioned ambulance with the air conditioning turned right up and you're sploshing water in the back of the ambulance trying to get them to cool down basically because that's better than sitting there in the sun basically waiting for the ambulance to arrive. Yeah, no, it's uh, great, great to see this and know that there are uh, preferred techniques but that it doesn't mean the other techniques shouldn't be done. If that's, if that's what you have available to you is pull people out of the sun and evaporative techniques that, that, that has some benefit. There are other things that have more benefit, but at least as, as a way to do something to help decrease that core body temperature and hopefully get them, uh, get them to a better place, uh, cooler place as soon as possible. Great. Looking at where we are with time, I want to make sure I had an opportunity to, to Nisi, give you a, a little bit of time to explore some of the other questions and some of the other first aid reviews that might have generated some public comment or even significant discussion among the task force members um, and just kind of get a little bit of insight, peel back the curtain a little bit and see, you know, what other areas were discussed a bit more that, that might really help to raise some awareness about issues with first aid and how we can improve the care that's delivered there. Sure, thanks, Justin. Um, I think probably the next biggest area of potential controversy is the use of a recovery position. And for many, many years, as long as I can remember in first aid, we've taught to put a person who is unresponsive but breathing normally into a recovery position, which has um, changed a little bit over the years, but is um, in general, putting them on their side in a lateral recumbent recovery position. So this recommendation in 2015 um, was uh, challenged a bit by some case reports and series in which patients placed in the recumbent position who were not breathing normally ultimately had an unrecognized cardiac arrest. So in response to this, we looked first at the wording of the PICO question. The PICO question uh, was, again, originally looking at people who were unresponsive but breathing normally. And in talking with all the first aid task force members, we realized that if somebody's unresponsive, they're typically not breathing normally. They're going to be uh, have a scenario such as a drug uh, overdose or alcohol intoxication or be postictal after a seizure or um, have an intracranial hemorrhage. And with those scenarios, they typically don't breathe normally. They are unresponsive and not breathing normally. So the wording of this question has been changed and um, it was made into a scoping review again. So again, we don't come out with a new recommendation unless we do a systematic review. Uh, but we changed the wording so that now it says that we're looking at uh, adults and children with a decreased level of consciousness from a medical illness or a spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage that do not meet criteria for starting rescue breathing or chest compressions, i.e. CPR. So with that, um, the review team started doing their literature search and they focused on other groups that would have similar potential problems such as obstructive sleep apnea, um, or people who have cervical spine injury, um, who may have um, further injury with movement, such as putting them on a, in a recovery position. 
um, or opioid overdose and toxicity and missed cardiac arrest. So they focused on those specific populations of interest um, and came up with a very complex you know, review that uh, gives us a good map of the literature for those specific populations. Um, but in general, the literature that they identified supports the use of the lateral recumbent recovery position for anybody with a decreased level of consciousness with medical injury and medical illness or spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage. Um, the task force did in discussion feel that it may be worth doing a dedicated systematic review on the use of a recovery position for opioid toxicity. So there is concern that when somebody, for instance, overdoses um, on a narcotic, that um, they are more ten prone to developing hypoventilation and apnea. And if the person's not being having their airway monitored constantly, that can be missed and lead to a hypoxic cardiac arrest. So when a recovery position is recommended, it doesn't mean lay them on their side and don't monitor re their respirations. Sometimes when you have a mass casualty um, condition scenario, then you may end up, if you have several different victims, you may have to keep them on their side and go from one to the next to the next. But in general, it's one person and you should be, if they're in a recovery position, monitoring their airway uh, like a hawk. So that's, that was probably the, the next biggest thing, Justin. Great. David, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, no, no, I just, uh, just to say that, you know, the recovery position is, it was designed basically for people to be left in as opposed to, um, uh, you know, so if you need to go, if you're on your own, you need to go and get help, then turn them on their side. But if you're with them, stay with them and monitor their airway. I'm sure we'd all agree about that, basically. That's the most important thing, that they, you continue to check their breathing and check that they've got a pulse uh, while help is arriving. Great. Well, I, I really appreciate both of you being on here, sharing some insights about the different PCOs that were reviewed for 2020. And, and I know there are many others, the supplemental oxygen for stroke, stroke scales, glucose administration, both in systematic reviews and scoping reviews for a number of different questions. Um, so I'd encourage anyone who is interested in these areas has a, a, a hand in the first aid uh, response or education spaces to check out the other systematic reviews and scoping reviews that were done for 2020. Um, I just wanted to kind of see what other things though in our last few minutes, what things uh, is the task force planning for next year? What other either scoping reviews or systematic reviews are you looking at? And so what can we anticipate for, for the next 12 to 18 months to come out of the task force? So um, if I can answer this, the biggest topics are gonna be cooling of burns, which is another thing that has been very controversial over the years. Um, since um, the most burn experts recommend cooling for a minimum of 20 minutes. And in past reviews by ILCOR, we've found that that recommendation comes from animal studies and not from any um, well-controlled human trials. So we're looking at that once again now. Uh, we're also looking at what's the best choice of um, liquids to drink for rehydration following um, exercise when you get dehydrated, such as like after marathons or um, biking races and so forth. Um, David mentioned we're looking at pediatric tourniquets. There's a little bit more literature that's coming out uh, trickling in that we're going to try to do a systematic review with. Uh, we're looking at best means for removing a tick, and we're doing a scoping review on using ice or cryotherapy for nosebleeds. Uh, we've not done a systematic review on ice for nosebleeds in the past because we've not seen any significant literature on it. And so the scoping review will hopefully uh, show us what evidence there is for it. And if there's uh, enough to evidence to do a systematic review, then we will move on to that. So that's, those are the biggies for this next year. Not as many as for 2020 by any means. Well, but still important questions, you know, the cooling of burns, uh, rehydration strategies, as, as we mentioned before, the, the, the pediatric population and questions surrounding uh, just general care often are, have limited data relative to the adult population. So each of those, uh, are, are important questions and, and it'll be great to 
hear what comes out and what information is found, what recommendations come out as a result of those searches. So, well, Nisi and David, thank you very much for taking your time to share your expertise, share the findings of the task force, um, what's come out of this significant body of work that, that went into the 2020 publication. Um, I, I know that was the, the work of so many different individuals. The two of you are on here today, but there were a lot of folks that were involved in that. So appreciate uh, both you two leading the task force and all the other task force members for their work that went into it. Before we go, anything else that either of you two wanted to add? Just want to say thank you to you. Great chairmanship. <laughs> and thank you, Justin, for this. This has uh, been a delight and I appreciate David and his work. Um, as my vice chair, he's been more than supportful. He's been my, my right hand. So thank you, David. Wonderful. Well, thank you both. And again, I encourage anyone who's watching this or listening to it to go and check out the 2020 treatment recommendations for the first aid task force. Mm -hmm.